Okay, well, welcome everybody. This is the February 2016 monthly community meeting. Uh, my name is Rudy Potenzone, uh, responsible for marketing for the foundation, and I will uh, moderate this uh, meeting today. The agenda for the meeting is shown here. Um, Keith will give us a foundation update. John, uh, an update on the development schedule. Uh, I'll come back and talk a li little bit about the training program and upcoming events. And then our guest speaker for today is Scott Wagers uh, from BioSci Consulting. BioSci is our, our newest member. They've joined as a silver member. Uh, and he will talk about both his company and also his work with Etrix. So to get us started, I'm going to turn it over to Keith. Hey, thanks, Rudy. Um, did I have a slide in there? There you go. There we go. So uh, let me give you all a, a quick update on the foundation. It's, uh, it's been a very busy time for us. Uh, we're in the midst of a, of a transformation, uh, really becoming a, full, a fully integrated nonprofit software company, uh, focusing quite a bit on what we're doing in terms of managing the roadmap and developing the roadmap. You've heard a lot about the roadmap overall. Uh, John is going to come and give you a bit of uh, progress on, uh, that we're making on that roadmap, specifically with respect to the, the six-month release cycle, the next release being the 16.1. Uh, it currently is uh, is now rolling into the Alpha 3, um, and the beta release at the end of the month, and going forward from there, John will give you detail there. Um, I'd like to, uh, to quick comment on the board meeting. We had a, an excellent uh, board meeting on the 26th. It was uh, a great discussion, strategic discussion amongst the board members. One of the key things that came out of this is uh, the real emphasis on progress on the roadmap and specifically towards the, uh, the full specification and development of the 17.1 project. So you'll hear a lot about the 17.1 project in the near future. Um, one thing that uh, I'll let you know is that we, uh, following up on the, the board's direction, uh, we hired Ken Kubota to come in as a business analyst to work with us on uh, gathering requirements and specifications for the 17.1 project, including uh, key use cases. Uh, the group has been out there meeting with groups. We had uh, meetings so far with the University of Michigan. Uh, we've had meetings with, uh, with Santa Fe. Uh, they're meeting tomorrow with Roche. And uh, we have continued meetings going forward. Um, the, this will be a process that will be going on for the next few weeks. But the key goal is to have every potential stakeholder in the project uh, have some feedback and, and input into the specifications and the use cases that will drive that development. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, uh, to follow up uh, from some of the other key aspects of the board meeting, one of the things the board has asked us to focus on quite a bit is, is how we raise and manage funding uh, to, to run these development projects. So the 17.1 project is the first project that the foundation is doing the full specification on. We'll be doing the fundraising on, and we'll be managing the development cycle and release cycle of. Uh, to facilitate this, we've brought a new team member on board. Uh, Ron Guerrero has joined us. Uh, Ron has extensive experience in both business development and foundation development, having worked with uh, groups like Partners, Olin College of Engineering, the Accelerated Cures Project, and more. Uh, Ron uh, has been reaching out to board members, and will be reaching out to, to other member companies. Uh, specifically around fundraising around the 17.1 project. So you, if you haven't heard from Ron yet, you will hear from Ron. Uh, we're great. We're really pleased to have Ron on the team. And, uh, and as we do with people we bring on board, he's coming up to speed very, very quickly. Uh, we have a number of key events that uh, are moving forward as well. Uh, the BioIT World Meeting is coming up uh, first week of April. Uh, we have our board meeting on April 5th. In conjunction with that meeting, we have a community meeting, etc. And one of the things I'd, I'd like to, uh, to say today is that uh, we're partnering with the Pasoya Alliance specifically in pulling our community meeting together, and they'll be participating with us in our community meeting at the BioIT World event. Uh, we're also recruiting sponsors. I think Rudy will tell you a little bit more about that um, overall. Uh, but we have a, a couple of key sponsors lined up for our events at BioIT World. If you have an interest in, in co-sponsorship of events, please contact Rudy and, and discuss that. We also have another big event coming up uh, in the summer. Uh, we're doing a joint meeting with uh, Zach Mahoney's group at Harvard Medical School, uh, working with the I2B2 team and his precision medicine effort. Uh, we have a three-day meeting uh, at Harvard Medical School. Uh, the first day of the meeting is the I2B2 community meeting. The second day of the meeting is a large uh, Zach Mahoney organized 
a precision medicine meeting, and the third day is a Transmark community meeting. So we're working together with, with Zach's group at Harvard and expanding out of what we do in the precision medicine space. This is all part of our efforts to expand our community and continue to grow the community so we can bring additional resources to bear on our key challenges. Another key issue that's come up for us is what's happening with our licensing and IP strategy. Uh, we've been very, uh, uh, very uh, lucky to, to get the attention of Karen Koppenhaver from, uh, from Choke here in Boston. Uh, she also is the uh, general counsel for Linux Foundation. Uh, she's getting involved with us and with the board in helping to uh, develop and, and mature our IP strategy. Uh, we're really pleased with that because this opens up additional doors of collaboration between the foundation and Linux Foundation, which is a group that we've worked with in the past, and with the uh, Open Bell project we'll be working with more so in the future as well. So we're really pleased to be working with Karen and making a lot of progress on what we're doing in terms of IP strategy and key license strategies for as we develop the platform. Uh, from the Alliance front, not only are we working closely with uh, the Soy Alliance, uh, the group from which uh, the foundation was in fact officially uh, uh, launched out of, and uh, we're also working very closely with the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. Uh, we were taking part in their uh, data working group, and we're uh, now joining their clinical uh, working group. Uh, one of the key challenges here is to make sure that the platform is compliant with uh, the various APIs and specifications being developed by uh, the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health. So it's been a, a very active uh, first couple of months of the, of the new year. The team is working very hard to make things uh, come forward here, and you'll see a lot of progress as we go forward in the future as we continue to transition into a more active and, and integrated uh, nonprofit software uh, development company. So with that, let me uh, turn things back to Rudy, and Rudy, you can organize things from there. If there are questions at the end, I'm happy to take them. All right, great. Thank you, Keith. Um, John, are you there in the room with Keith? Absolutely. Okay, well, over to you. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. I'll just give you a quick update on the three releases that are in, uh, you know, basic form, you know, various forms of, of production at this point. If you'll move to the next slide, please. So as, as you can see from this slide right now, uh, we are very near the release of our 60.1 release. Excuse me. Sorry. We are very near the end, uh, end of our 16.1 release, and the 16.1 uh, release I was hoping to be able to tell you today uh, is ready for is ready for uh, Alpha 3 testing. It is up on the servers. Uh, we have some of the uh, some of the data sets loaded with Postgres, and we're still uh, working a little bit on the Oracle uh, server, but uh, we expect to see that uh, you know within the next 24 hours. So emails will go out to the broader community about the Alpha 3 release. We'd like to get as thorough a uh, test on that by the community as possible. Our 16.2 uh, release, as you can see from this roadmap, uh, is basically in uh, development now. We've had a variety of meetings with uh, people who are contributing plugins for this release. So I think you'll all remember that the core plugins that we're working to get in are the Smart R uh, workflows that were done with Luxembourg and uh, the Hive, and those are making uh, good progress. We expect to be making more progress there over the next uh, 45 or so days. Um, and uh, and XNAP, the uh, neuroimaging plugins are are making good progress uh, as well. So. Uh, if you can move to 16.2, thank you. So with, with that, uh, the XNAT neuroimaging plugins have been have been reviewed, and there are two of them. Uh, they will be available for uh, you to use. Uh, we will be supporting both of them optionally, and uh, whereas the Smart R, I think, will be turned on by default, at least at this juncture. And then the last uh, capability is uh, some GWAS features that are being contributed by our community member Pfizer, uh, and we expect those to go in. Uh, a key function here uh, as well will be streamlining and simplifying the ETL process, and within the next few days, we expect to be we expect to be uh, doing a, a, a webinar of some sort to talk about uh, extensions to the ICE tool. Uh, Peter Rice, our 
a fellow in that space will be will be giving an update on uh, changes and additions to the ICE tool contributed by various community members, most notably uh, Sanofi. Let me interrupt one second, John. Sure. Rudy, is is this is the slideshow using timings? Can you yes, turn it that is. off? Yeah, I was trying to is just. It? Yeah, it's just these three slides for some reason, but yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. you can just do the go to slideshow and turn off use timings. Our our apologies for that. So in setup show right there, yeah. Great. This uh, yep, manually, there you go. Okay. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Okay, thanks, Rudy. It was making me crazy. <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was a little bit. Yeah, CEO and PowerPoint technical support. A little, little, boy, little bit of uh, motion sickness. So SmartR, XNet, and GWAS are all uh, you know, on, on good track to making it into the 16.2 uh, release, and we'll, uh, you know, we'll be highlighting more uh, in the next community meeting on those. The ICE tool will be will be setting up a webinar to describe the uh, additions, changes to the ICE tool. And then, uh, and, and then one thing I'll just mention very briefly: there are a couple of things on the bubble that may go into this release if they are available on time. One is a uh, improved install mechanism that uh, is a little bit more focused at cloud and uh, and hosting providers, uh, based on a Chef tool that's out and. The other uh, is, is some omics work that uh, is being contributed by one community member that, again, uh, is not quite from a um, legal perspective ready to include, but we expect to, uh, to be technically ready. We'll hopefully have that available as well. If you can move to 17.1, I'll just cover the last section really quickly. Great. So I think everybody knows that 17.1 uh, is the most aggressive release that the uh, foundation has, uh, has focused on. Uh, the core features there are longitudinal data in the, in the format of an I2B2 reintegration, and uh, that we expect to have a couple that we expect to have a couple of, of uh, uh, flavors of one flavor that will work with. Uh, the I2B2 system full blown, and another uh, which may have some limited capabilities without the I2B2 in, uh, without the I2B2 application running side by side. Uh, that is in active uh, investigation right now with good support from our community. And then also, I think everyone knows that we had hoped to have some uh, scalable genomic database support in this release. And that uh, work and the workflows associated with that are being discussed now with a variety of community members. We have a team of, uh, of folks in Europe right now meeting with a couple of key community members. And uh, then they will be coming back. And based on that and some feedback from University of Michigan, uh, we'll be making the sweep through with stakeholders from the United States. And if there are some specific genomic workflows <coughs> around whole genome sequences or uh, data or, or uh, you know, genome browsers or any particular type of functionality that you'd like to see, please reach out to me personally. And we'll either get our guys in front of you uh, in a go-to-meeting or we'll get our team uh, working with you face-to-face. -face. But we definitely want to make... Uh, make some good progress over the next 30 days in defining the workflows there and uh, specifically you know, phasing that out into a 17.1 and probably a 7. So good progress has been making there, but again, this is still early days for that and we're uh, actively working on it. So that's where we stand with respect to this. So the 16.1 release, just to highlight it, this is the thing right in front of our windshield. That release, otherwise, otherwise sometimes called the 1.25 release, uh, is about to hit alpha 3. Target date for that is around the end of the month for the beta. And once we're in beta, we expect that to uh, really be on rails and, and be available to the community, uh, you know, essentially in full function end of, end of March. So that's it. That's uh, where we stand right now. Any, uh, I'll... I'll stop. Any questions, uh, feel free to ask at the end. Okay, thanks a lot, John. Great update.
All right, I'm going to take a minute to talk a little bit about our training program. Um, this has been ongoing now for a year. Uh, we've trained uh, uh, quite a few people uh, at this point. Um, this is the kind of one of the uh, uh, opening slides as we look at uh, new user training. Uh, although this year in uh, collaboration between the content committee and the community committee, uh, and a lot of work but with Julie uh, from, uh, the, from Rancho uh, and um, Sherry from, the, from uh, Sanofi, we've, been, we've uh, been able to put together this training program. You'll see that um, there are quite a few classes with a number of new topics, including on loading data, advanced workflows, uh, using the uh, APIs, um, and uh, we're already getting people registered for uh, most of these classes. Um, and uh, all of the training is being contributed by Thomson Reuters, by Rancho Bioscience, uh, and by The Hive. Um, and uh, we hope to add more as we move ahead. Uh, and I encourage you to go to the website and uh, check out descriptions of the classes, and please uh, register uh, as appropriate. Um, Please let colleagues in your companies or other groups that you work with know about the training. And um, there's a lot of uh, good good content here that uh, we're, we're really excited about. Uh, I just want to give you a quick update of our events for 2016. Keith mentioned a couple of these already. Uh, we are having a special webinar um, on February 29th on I2B2 and the integration. Uh, Paul Aviek from Harvard is going to be talking. Uh, I think John is. and. Uh, this will be available. Uh, we will record this and make it available, but uh, we, you need to register for it, and uh, you can um, and go to uh, go to webinar again. And uh, uh, again, description is on the website. We will be at the Tricon Molecular Medicine meeting in San Francisco uh, in booth 421. Uh, if you're attending that meeting or you have colleagues attending, please tell them to stop by and say hello. Uh, we will have a, a good, strong presence once again at BioIT World. Uh, again, we have a booth. Uh, and uh, we're, we're excited to be uh, working with Thomson Reuters to, co to sponsor the community meeting with us on Wednesday evening. And a lot more details will be uh, coming about that shortly. Um, and um, we will be, uh, I'll be working with um, the Pistoia Alliance to uh, put together a, a great program for that evening for you all. And then uh, the, the other one that we're, a brand new uh, activity that we're, we're working with Harvard uh, and the, the I2B2 group there uh, is, as Keith mentioned, uh, becoming uh, the third day of their uh, very fine conference, where the first day June, on June, uh, should be 21st, sorry, uh, is the I2B2 Shrine Annual Conference, the second day Precision Medicine Meeting, and then the third day uh, talking about Transmark and I2B2 integration uh, and looking at you know what, what will be coming and, and what the value has been for those groups who are using both systems. And so... A lot of details will be coming uh, about that meeting shortly, but um, you know, mark your calendars uh, if that's something of interest to you. We think it's going to be really an exciting uh, couple of days there, and um, we're hoping to put together a really, really good program for you. So uh, now uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Scott Wagers. Um, Scott is from Biocide Consulting. They are a silver member of the foundation. And he's going to give us an update uh, on his company and also um, his work with Etrix. Uh, Scott, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Do you hear me? Yes, sounds fine. Yes, uh, well, thank you, Rudy. I think what I, what I wanted to focus on is, is sort of you know, why we as Biosite Consulting have joined the Transmart Foundation. And, you know, in the short, it's because of Etrix. Um, but you know, but I want to begin with that a little more context as to what we do at Biosite Consulting and how that interacts with eTrix and, and how that's important in this whole context. So Rudy, if you could do the next slide. I want to begin with a little bit of psychology, actually. And this is something you probably all are quite familiar with, Maslow's Pyramid, which basically says everybody has a hierarchy of human needs, you know, which go from physiology to safety to love, esteem, actualization. But if you think about it in the context of research, translational research, medical research, there's also a pyramid for that. Next slide, Rudy. And, you know, and I, we put this concept together that you can begin with, you know, at the basis of this pyramid is funding and then methods and assets. You need to have methods, techniques, clinical cohorts to get your research done. That generates data, which then generates the what's called the, the currency of, of research was publications. 
But the self-actualization, the, the real goal of everything is to create step changes, you know, to change the field, to move things along. And in what we see really in recent years, and particularly in the case of data, we're becoming more and more able to do more, collect more complex data sets, do more complex research. So that really means there's a bigger and growing need to do that in the context of collaboration. You can click the next uh, next button, next slide there. And you know the reality is, you know, research has always been done with collaboration, but it's more and more of an issue. Now, one of the problems with collaboration is that in some ways it can be an inefficient process. And so really, when you come down to it, along all these different levels, next slide, you know, there are opportunities to increase efficiency. Um, and collaboration, when done well, can actually foster that efficiency. Um, and what's one of the key techniques, one of the key ways to do that is to really broaden that collaboration and bring in multiple stakeholders, which the next slide, Rudy. Um, and that's really about patience. So, you know, and that really comes down to the context of what we do at Biosite Consulting. It's all really encapsulated in this slide. And the next slide. And that's really about facilitating life science collaborations and making, you know, ideas for step changes in the life sciences concrete. Now, as I mentioned before, some of the big problems with consortia is that they can be inefficient. And there was a recent paper, next slide, in the uh, in science translational uh, research about consortium fatigue. And these two authors, you know, coined this term and really pointed out that one of the biggest problems with uh, consortia is that they're chaotic, and quite frankly, they don't deliver as much as they should uh, often. Um, and you know, we've been involved in a number of different consortia. Next slide. You know, including uh, Ubiopred, which is 44 partners, so a large consortium. Airprom, another consortium, which is computational modeling um, of the lung Ubiopreds on severe asthma. Of course, you know, the, the, what we're talking about here, Etrix, um, the COPD map, TSP Erica, and we also help. Um, helping the U.S. research agency define a new research agency. So, you know, these are our experience, and our experience is that actually, particularly in the case of Ubiopred, which has now finished its funding period, these projects can deliver and can be recognized to have done very well. And there's really three words that, that describe, you know, that process or that approach. If you can, next slide, Rudy. And of course, first is being efficient, being transdisciplinary, and really focus on being impactful. Next slide. So, you know, the concept of efficient lean collaboration, um, you can just click through these until the end of the slide, really, there's like three or four of them. The first is really, you know, when you're trying to write the proposals, which can be a significant amount of work, really focusing on making those efficient. You know, running a consortium management in a way that's that is efficient, meaning continual communication, and we function as a neutral moderator. And we also focus on blocking issues. That's often a major problem. And helping with planning and logistics and making that very efficient. Next slide. So really what we want to try to do and try to achieve is, you know, this is a, a graphic from uh, Stephen Covey, uh, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, which I'm sure you probably have heard of or at least have read. And he points out that in any kind of collaboration or any kind of work, really, you have two axes. One is the, the level of cooperation that you have, and the other is the level of trust. When you're in a, in a low cooperation, a low trust situation, you end up with next um, win-lose and lose-lose situations, which are really not ideal. As you progress along that line next, you have really respectful but compromise. Now, no one likes compromise. Compromise means that you're not doing exactly what you want to do. You're giving in on something. So really what we try to focus for is the last one, which is synergistic win-win uh, combinations. And that's where all of the principles of making sure people talk about uh, aspects. For example, in Ubiopred, we would have 30 conference calls a month at the end of that project. 
And at the first, people resisted that idea of having conference calls that frequently. But in the end, they were requesting more and more because they realized that because of the syn synergistic win-win combination of experts and, and expertise to resolve issues is actually more efficient, which really gets into the next next slide, if you would, Rudy. Um, that you know, it, it's really about being transdisciplinary and really leveraging the value of having multiple stakeholders. And you can just click through these next few bullets here. Um, and an important aspect of that is transparency, bringing it into the group, but also making sure that you have the conflicts you need to have. Another aspect, which I'll go into a little bit later um, in more detail, is involving patients in research not as participants in the study, but as team members. And that's part of that transdisciplinary aspect. But what we've also started to do more and more of is what we call collaborative think tanks, which a think tank is discussion followed by action, as well as organizing discussion games. And both of these help to form new collaborations, but also help to really engage the different stakeholders, particularly patients, in the whole process. Um, next slide. And lastly, you know, there's been more and more focus on, you know, how do you valorize and make your project impactful? And, you know, that's, you know, we really apply lean startup principles to do that. You know, the first and core part of that, which goes along with making the step changes, is having a shared vision that can drive and keep your project driving. Figuring out business plans and business models to keep a project either it's outcomes being valorized and or sustained so that the impact is not just simply the funding period but it continues and that's all about business development. Next slide. So you know when you come down to it you know what we really are focused on is this whole pyramid and this whole focused here this whole area but our you know in this context you know, right in the center here, right in the core of this is data, and that's where Etrix comes in. So next slide. Now many of you may be familiar with Etrix, but Etrix is an innovative medicines initiative project based in Europe, which is a public-private uh, partnership with um, 11 pharma members and uh, six academic centers and or organizations and SMEs. And the mission of eTrix, and, and I'll just take, take a minute here because I think there's often confusion between you know, what is the Transmart Foundation and what is Transmart and what is eTrix. And you know, this mission statement helps to hopefully clear that up in that you know, the mission of eTrix is to maximize the impact of translational research data sets by providing platform services, guidance, and trainings that enable the efficient integration, staging, and exploration, preservation, and reuse of translational research data. I think one of the things that's really focused on here is services, and most of that services is focused in collaborative projects, um, mostly in Europe. So next slide. What I want to pull up here, and just click a couple more times if you would, is and really emphasize is, you know, the mantra that we've developed in, in eTrix, which goes along with a lot of the objectives and the goals of the Transmart Foundation, which is that integrated and explorable data are valuable data. And that's really what we're trying to achieve in the end. And you know, there's a lot we could talk about in eTrix, but I wanted to focus down on you know, you know, sort of the what's potentially interesting more to the Transmart Foundation. So the next slide. Many of you may already know this. Uh, but this is a, a slide that I've borrowed from um, Ibrahim Iman from Imperial College that sort of, you know, describes the environment that eTrix is in, operating in, you know, and, and with the role of, the, of Transmart in that environment, in that you have data coming in from clinical studies or, or other uh, aspects, you know, using certain tools. You also have standards such as the CDIS standards that then, you know, need to come in and be placed into Transmart. But what eTrix is focusing on in its first phase, and it's still an active uh, contributor in the in the Transmart aspect, but also 
beginning to focus more on what's sort of around the environment here. And one of the problems that we've identified in all the work with the different projects, and I think, you know, I think it's pretty common to understand, is that the curation process uh, is one of the biggest bottlenecks. And so as a, as a means to expand upon that uh, and, and to work on that, we've created uh, and begun to work on you know, data harmonization, which the next slide, which is the, what we're calling the Atrix Harmonization Services, or EHS. And this is driven by Ibrahim at Imperial College, but I want to take the moment here to say all the things I'm going to show you, I'm going to list out who's driving them, but in the end, they're very much uh, contributed by many, many people in the Atrix project, which is one of the strengths of the project, it's highly collaborative. But the idea um, is that you, know, you have project data and you want to have tools and systems that make that process of getting the data into the Transmart tree and into Transmart much more efficient. So you know, there are planned or ideas to have a metadata registry, you know, have a process and tools to support uh, the standardization and transformation of that data into the tree and then follow uh, you know, a standard harmonization process and the standard terminology so that you can essentially bring data into the system, into Transmart, not completely resolve the curation process, but make it much more efficient. And this is part of what we're calling Atrix Labs, so it's definitely something we're developing as an open source you know, Etrix Labs is on the website. We really want people to begin to kind of help to co-create this, uh, and, we're, and this is beginning to prog to progress um, quite nicely. Um, and and that's one of the you know the first step in that process. So if you go to the next slide, you know, but like as I mentioned, we're still Etrix is still very much focused on on helping and working with the Transmart Foundation. And in particular with data analytics, which is one thing that John mentioned earlier, next slide. And that is the Smart R project. And you know, that's being driven uh, at Luxembourg by Sasha Herzinger, but again, multiple people are working on this in Etrix. And in fact, this is a great example of where Etrix and the Transmart Foundation are working well together in that this is now beginning to become integrated into Transmart. There's been recently a hackathon on that and there's still continuing progress. The concept of Smart R is quite simple in a, in a sense that to be able to, in your browser, do a number of analytics without having to, to, to reload or re-access the analysis within Transmart. Next slide. And some of the things that um, are involved in that is you know, having an advanced heat map that you can uh, reshuffle and sort um, relatively quickly and with a nice visual interface. Next slide. There's also, um, you know, within uh, Smart R, the plan to have timeline analyses. Um, it's one of the, the challenges we've seen in some of the projects is people want to look over time from different data points and to do that relatively quickly when they're exploring the data sets. You know, part of Smart R's vision is to, is to actually achieve that. Next slide. And there's also, you know, being able to take and look across studies with a, with a, with a box plot analyses to be able to make some on the fly exploratory analyses you know, across studies, uh, which is also, you know, in a way, that's perhaps the big vision is to be able to reuse data, to save data, preserve data, and ultimately, you know, also make it open so that we can really leverage the value of all the data that's present. Next slide. And then last in this chain that I want to be, that we've begun uh, to also focus on is this, you know, end piece here, um, where we're, you know, what do you do once you have the data? How do you make use of it? And just one example that we've come up with in Etrix. Next slide is something, you know, where we're focused on disease disease networks using a graph database approach to systems biology and medicine. This is driven by and the EISBM. Um, which is a partner through the CNRS and in, in, is driven by Mansour and Arena. And the idea is to, is to bring together a number of different tools uh, to be able to develop disease networks, you know, in an integrative management framework. And there's a fair amount of 
to bring all this information together in, in a unified way to allow data exploration and visualization, um, which will ultimately helps to drive hypothesis generation. I'm just going to show you one screenshot of that. Next slide. And this is one aspect of it. It's a protein framework. And I don't really want to go into the details of what's here, but it's just to show you that it's a, it's a, it's a very simple to, to, to visualize uh, interface with a lots of information behind it within the blue balls here are genes and then there's different concepts and, and different networks that you can use and we've seen it used in some of the projects as part of the pilots to take what's an existing map and then add your data or your information you're learning from it and you know seeing where there are gaps to generate new hypotheses because if one network doesn't seem to show up maybe that's link in the chain that you need to go test. So it's a way of processing the knowledge and making more value from the knowledge, you know, once you have it loaded into Transmart, once you've done your study. Next slide. So in a sense, you know, eTrix is working across this entire, uh, in, entire spectrum here. And, you know, what we've done, we've supported something like 27 projects in one way or another. And that has been a process, you know, in the first phases of being deeply engaged with those projects to really understand their processes uh, that helped us to understand the problems and, and where, you know, things needed to happen, which is why things like EHS have been developed. Uh, and now we're in a process of, we have a goal of 40 projects, which we support both in, you know, providing the platform but also in the sense of understanding their problems and helping them with their data modeling. Um, the next slide. But eTrix is more than just um, services and a, and a platform. We also have a number of um, valuable resources we've, we've generated, like the Transmar Foundation. We have a, you know, we've given a number of eTrix trainings. I think now over 400 people have been trained in the platform, you know, one thing that eTrix focuses on and, and does particularly well with is actually training using a project's data. So we actually use the data and use that as a training session, which tends to work quite well. Uh, we've also published a uh, standard starter pack so that data harmonization, you know, a project comes, they, they know what standards they can use. We have a public platform which has a number of different data sets on it from legacy platforms. Um, and we have a code of practice about uh, the reuse of medical research data, which is uh, in, under consideration to become, you know, um, endorsed by the European Union. Um, and that's actually a really important step because one of the problems that transitional researchers face is not knowing what to do, or what they can do with medical research data. So that's one of the values of this resource. Next slide. You know, eTrix has been very successful, and it, it is a consortium, and, and, and we find value in working in this way, and that's sort of also, you know, where our role as Biosci Consulting comes in and, and what, what interests us in the project. And eTrix has about a year and a half of funding left from the IMI, but we want to, you know, make sure that that knowledge and that experience, you know, continues on. So we have the concept with which we're developing the structure and, and validating the processes for what we're calling the eTrix network, which I've got depicted here. And the eTrix network um, is really envisioned to be a consortium or collaborative model for, you know, serving projects and or individual clients. And, it, and the concept is that you have a number of partners um, who are arranged in sort of a hub and spoke model that agree to work on projects collaboratively. And the key is instead of having a typical network where you may bid for a project, each partner may have specific expertises such as, you know, um, you know, providing advice or training or, you know, ETL that they, that they line up along a spoke. So when a project comes in, you know, through a process of, business development and collaboration management, you know, we bid and see, you know, who, who wants to do it. So we 
basically form a consortium that will then serve that serve that project. Um, and if somebody can't do it, then the next in line comes in. Now, you know, the vision is to make this you know a, a community of practice that continues the experience and the knowledge we've gained and can help serve projects. And this is one of the, the main you know reasons for joining the Transport Foundation as well is to, is to think about this and to bring this in and, and be part of the community. Uh, so that's in development. We've got some pilot projects going in this. This is something um, we haven't put into full force yet, but it's something that's on, on its way. Next slide. But you know, and, and as, as I mentioned, you know, we want to capture that knowledge and 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 so one thing we we we've, we've just put on our website and we're beginning to start to promote something we call the Etrix Manifesto, which is sort of encapsulates the the philosophy behind Etrix, and you know. What it says is, you know, it's a societal responsibility to maximize the impact of medical research data sets. And then it goes on through the, the typical values such as integrated data is valuable. You know, one of the biggest bottlenecks is the inability and the, the lack of availability of data to actually make progress. And, you know, also touching on issues about privacy and the value of data and the importance of standards and that really a, a common platform such as the Transmart uh, platform is important. And later on we actually mention the Transmart in the manifesto. But the idea behind the manifesto is just a way to get the message out about this that you know integrated and explorable data is valuable data, which is the core philosophy behind Atrix. So it's on our website. People can come, you know, sign up and say, yes, I endorse this. And if, and if people want, we can put them on the website, you know, sort of as a way of signing up. So if you're interested, please come to the website, take a look at this. But I want to bring this up for an, another reason as well, is in that the first statement is a societal responsibility. And in a way, that also means it's a societal activity. So one of the things we did at the very outset of Etrix is, is put in a plan, you know, to say, oh, we want to involve patients. And admittedly, we weren't really sure um, what that would look like or how that would go in this project that's focused on bioinformatics, data, IT. Next slide. But really what we're, what we're coming to is that there's, you know, in the projects, you know, as BioSci Consulting uh, and in the context, that there's an evolution of patient involvement in research. And, you know, it really started out, you know, we have patients as study participants, they're enrolled in the study, they get informed consent. For a long time, you know, most of that was focused also on patient involvement was public education. You know, people had many community medical schools, which at the time, about 10 years ago, was actually quite novel. That's really accelerated recently with online resources. In some of the projects that we've had, you know, as I mentioned before, Ubiopred, we actually had patients involved in the team, actually in the working team, in the work packages, and you know the experience with that was was very very positive, both from the researchers who felt they helped to provide motivation and passion as to what they were doing, and at the end of Ubiopred, we asked the patients, you know, you were involved in some of these different things. Which aspects, if you were to do it again, would you want to be involved in? And they said all of it enthusiastically. Um, but moving on, one of the concepts that came out of that work was that patients said, but we want to be involved not just in the project, but also in the formation. So we've begun, you know, in the collaborative think tanks that we pull together um, to, you know, involve patients in that and patient organizations. Um, you know, so that's good. They're helping to form the formation. But the next evolution, the next you know, step in that is really taking it even further and having the patients help to collaborate on issues. I think if you look, um, there's many examples, there's some examples of this in the, in, the, in the US, particularly in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease where looking at biomarker qualification, um, where uh, the patients were key to actually getting the first real biomarker in chronic obstructive pulmonary disease qualified from the FDA. 
And anecdotally, you know, the, the feeling is that didn't progress until the patient organizations got involved. And I think there's probably lots of examples of different nonprofit patient organizations which are becoming more and more interested uh, in data. I think a lot of them, some of them in the in our foundation, like the Michael J. Fox Foundation, for example. And so, you know, it is becoming more of a societal activity. So that gives a, that gave us a key to understand what can we do with uh, with patients on the deeper level within eTrix to make it more meaningful engagement. And so we've come to the concept of you know convening a, a science cafe or or discussion game where we begin with you know inter interviewing patients individually, and then we bring a multidisciplinary discussion. And there's a there's a there's, there's a concept and approach called play decide, which Next slide. Which is meant to be a way to engage patients and multidisciplinary groups to discuss issues where people may feel either intimidated or um, fearful of discussing. And, and the idea, in, in short, this is from the website of Play the Side, is you develop a number of different info cards, issue cards, story cards, and then everyone in a group, the individuals come together, they, they identify a set of four or five cards that they really think are interesting to them or were new information to them. And then that is used as a small group to drive a discussion and then that's sort of brought together and then you may have a different policy or issues that patients then, the patients of the whole group kind of votes upon. It's a way of getting more meaningful input from you know stakeholders um, around different issues. It's been used actually quite a bit in in a lot of life science uh, topics, um, particularly neurology. Um, and so our thought is to take this and bring this to the issue of, of data. And now of course there's a lot being done on data privacy, data protection. But the one idea, you know, getting back to our, our mission and our, and, our, and our mantra is that you know, integrated and explorable data is valuable data. So we want to use this as a tool to understand what do patients understand about the value of data or the value of data reuse. Because we think, you know, we, we kind of under thought there may be a gap there. Or there may be different um, thoughts and different perspectives between, you know, data scientists, translational researchers, and patients. So where we're at with this so far is we've interviewed a number of different patients on an individual basis, and we're planning at the end of March to have a play to side discussion game with a, uh, a melanoma patient network with actually advocates from melanoma uh, present um, and patients with melanoma to understand, you know, what the gaps are and their understanding of the value of data. I just want to take a brief moment and take you through you know, just a couple of the findings from the individual interviews, which I think may be interesting to, to this, to you all. Next slide. You know, the first key knowledge gap is that you know, patients don't seem to really understand that there's a balance between the value of data and data privacy. You know, if you ask them, they'll say, well, make my data, you know, anonymized, completely protected, secured away. But when you tell them that that means their data won't be able to be reused as easily, or in some cases may actually stop it being reused, or you know stop you know certain aspects of clinical trials that need to do longitudinal follow-up and go back to the file or get back to the patient, you know they, they begin to you know, say, oh, I didn't realize that. And the, the interesting thing that they didn't quite understand is that there's a difference between you know anonymization and you know either pseudo anonymization or coded data. And they were often quite comfortable with that concept, as opposed to making the very strong statement, always has to be secure and, and, and anonymized. So there's a gap there that, that perhaps we can develop something to help you know, expand that knowledge. But another thing that came out of this discussion, next slide, which is perhaps a little more interesting, is this here, is that there's, there's you know, this is, a, this is a concept, so it's not exactly database, but it seems subjectively to be a fairly linear relationship between a patient's data protection attitude, whether they want it to be very private or sharing, and the severity of their disease. 
when their disease is mild, they really go for privacy. When their disease is severe, you know, share the data as much as you can. I want you to find a cure, is the statement. So, you know, I think that's an important thing that we have to take into consideration when we're thinking about, you know, data protection, data privacy. There may need to be different rules depending upon the severity of the disease. And then the next slide is, you know, we, when Trevor from our organization, Trevor Garrett, did these interviews, he, at the very end, he, said, he stopped and said, anything you want to ask? And, you know, in a couple of times, this, you know, variations of this question came up. Why aren't standards being used? Which is a very interesting, um, you know, question that kind of came spontaneously. I mean, we explained that there's a challenge with getting data harmonized, but, you know, so that's another, you know, point to, to, to drive motivation, to perhaps drive the adoption of standards, which I think we all agree is key to being able to improve the efficiency of the data curation and the, and the data reuse process. So next slide. So just, just to bring it all back around again, I mean, to answer the question, you know, why did we join the Transmart Foundation? Well, in the first instance, it's because data, you know, this pyramid which we're focused on as a company, data is in the center of that, you know, helping, re helping bring research, you know, to the step change motion, data is a key point, and it's becoming more and more of a key point, which is why we're involved in Etrix, you know, and, and is why, um, you know, we, all, we wanted to join the Transmart Foundation. But it's also key, you know, because Transmart Foundation, Etrix, they're all collaborations, and that's what we need. And, and there's actually becoming a growing, you know, even broader collaboration involving patients. Uh, and that all can be in, improved by, you know, driving the efficiency. So, next slide. Just to end, I mean, you know, this is a sort of a mixed talk between Biosci Consulting and Etrix. Here's different ways, you know, you can connect with us. You know, Etrix, the website, you can get to the manifesto. We have a newsletter. We have a Twitter account, and we have a, a, um, a LinkedIn group on Atrix. Um, and then, you know, this is our website. This is my blog uh, where I talk about collaboration, also on, on LinkedIn and, and Facebook. And the Facebook page is focused more on grants and, you know, patient involvement in research. So um, that's the reason, and that's the, the talk. And, uh, and I hope to, to have some more interactions with you through the Transport Foundation in the future. Thank you very much, Scott. Very interesting presentation. I think a lot of thoughtful things that uh, we can begin drill into. Um, we're near the end of our time, but uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to raise your hand, uh, and I'll try to recognize you. Uh, I don't see any questions so far that are typed in. You can also type in a question. Rudy, I, I see uh, Ward mentioned that uh, I think the date on the slide for the ITB2 conference at June 2nd. Yeah, I know. June yep. Okay. I, I did mention uh, that, but yeah, that was a mistake. Okay, good. Um, I just, let me say really quickly thanks to Scott. I think you guys at eTrix have really, I think, made great investments in Transmart, and we certainly appreciate that. And clearly, you guys are thought leaders in, in really thinking about what happens around Transmart in terms of data, the value of data, the value of collaboration. So, uh, you know, we look forward to, uh, you know, another year and a half at least of, of good interaction there and, and working with you, Scott, and with Etrix Labs uh, to keep that, uh, that interaction and collaboration going. I think that's, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any, anyone else? I don't see any other questions. So um, let me thank uh, Scott again. Uh, and uh, Keith and John, and I think we'll close the session. Thanks, everybody, uh, and we will be back here next month. Sounds great. Thanks, Thank everyone. you very much.